This will be my weekly update for the situation in Ukraine, the fifth week of Russian military operations in Ukraine. And as I have done in the past, I, I will do again. I want to remind people of how this all started. It did not start over a little over a month ago with Russia entering into Ukraine. It actually started eight years ago when the U.S. government helped violently overthrow the elected government of Ukraine and installed a hand-picked client regime to replace it. And ever since then, Ukraine's economy has been destroyed, the country divided against itself, uh, the regime backed by the US and other NATO members in Kiev have been waging war against the eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbas region. Uh, they had killed 14,000 people on both sides of this conflict, including over 3,000 civilians and, and mostly ethnic Russians. And this was being done right on Russia's border. And uh, the U.S. and NATO involvement in Ukraine, a country that borders Russia, is part of a much larger uh, and long, longer term uh, encirclement and encroachment by the U.S. and NATO on Russia's borders. So this was an existential threat being created right on Russia's borders. So here we are five weeks into these military operations. And uh, first thing I want to do is I want to dispel this line of propaganda where we're constantly told that Russia truly believed that they would roll into Ukraine, take over the entire country in 48 hours. And because they weren't able to, they are stalled. They have no plan now. They don't know what to do. Uh, President Vladimir Putin is backed up into a corner. I want to dispel this. I want to show you what Russia is doing. I want to show you a ongoing military operation that Russia is also involved in that is very similar to the one ongoing in Ukraine. And I also want to explain why things are not happening lightning fast on the battlefield in Ukraine. So first of all, and I've said this before, and it needs to be repeated because no one else is bringing this point up. Ukraine is bigger than, say, Iraq. The U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003. It took them a month to reach and take Baghdad. And that was after years and years of sanctions, of punitive strikes on Iraq leading up to the invasion to degrade their military abilities, uh, crippling sanctions that were killed half a million children alone in the lead up to the war. Uh, and uh, the U.S. went in with half a million troops. Between them and the U.K., there were half a million troops invading Iraq. And the way they went into Iraq was to just attack and destroy everything. Shock and awe. That was how the U.S. president at the time described their military operations in Iraq. So compare that to what Russia is doing now in Ukraine. Ukraine is 38% bigger than Iraq. In 2003, Iraq's population was 25 million. When Russia went into Ukraine, Ukraine's population was somewhere around 44 million people. And for the last eight years, the U.S. has been pouring billions of dollars of weapons and training into Ukraine's military. And even though the Ukrainian uh, economy has become dysfunctional, the U.S. and its allies have been pumping money in to keep the military alive and well. That said, Russia did not think they were going to take over Ukraine in two days. That's why they have uh, accumulated months and months worth of men, munitions, and machines all along the Russian-Ukrainian border and also staged in Belarus. Let's get into that right now. And I've done this before. I'm going to continue doing this. One of the sources that I look at every single week to, to try to fully understand that the situation in Ukraine and how everyone is looking at it is I go to the U.S. Department of Defense's official website and I look at their briefing. So this was just yesterday. I'm recording this on the 26th. So this was yesterday. They're saying we're now 30 days in. 1,250 missile launches since the start of the invasion. And they're talking about how uh, Russia is digging in around Kiev. They're not trying to advance. They're just digging in and they're prioritizing eastern Ukraine. And what they're going to do is try to encircle and cut off the very significant military force Ukraine has operating in eastern Ukraine. Once that is encircled and contained, that will cease to exist. They will either surrender or those units will be decimated. And either way, they will cease to exist in, in relation to this ongoing conflict. 
what else does it say? There's something else very interesting that they say. So right here, uh, the Defense Department official is saying, uh, you'll probably want to ask about two things. Uh, so one, the assessed available combat power. We hold the Russians less than 90%, somewhere between 85 and less than 90% of their assessed available combat power. So they continue to expend their resources and when talking about resources, I have not seen indications that they are trying to bring in resupply from elsewhere. Again, they have assembled an awful lot of their combat power to this fight. The Pentagon is saying is that Russia prepared a huge amount of resources uh, and prepared it ahead of this operation, for this operation. And they have not even exhausted that let alone bringing in more from elsewhere in Russia. They have somewhere between 85 and 90% of the, the combat power that they allotted for this operation ahead of time still at their disposal. Now keep that in mind because I'm going to show you uh, Russia's own update on where they see themselves right now in this operation. So this is a Russian news agency TASS operation in Ukraine proceeds as planned first stage goals complete. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, Ukrainian armed forces sustained serious losses. This is also from March 25th, 2022. And I want to come down to here. During the first month of the operation, a total of 1,351 Russian servicemen died, while 3,825 were injured. And then I want to go over to this Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty report from the same day, March 25th. Russia says 1,351 of its soldiers have died in Ukraine, well below Western estimates. Let's see what these Western estimates are. A NATO official told AP on March 24th that the Russian death toll was likely between 7,000 and 14,000, although numbers from both sides are impossible to independently confirm. And then we have this Wall Street Journal report. NATO says that up to 40,000 Russian troops have been killed, wounded, taken prisoner, or are missing in Ukraine. And they're basing that on, on the estimate of between 7,000 and 15,000 Russian soldiers being killed, and then extrapolating the, the number of casualties imprisoned, et cetera. And so they haven't confirmed any of these numbers. Uh, but when you think about that, uh, they're saying that Russia went into Ukraine with 190,000 troops, and if 40,000 of them are no longer in the fight, then their combat power is much lower than 90% or 85 to 90%, much, much lower. And yet the Pentagon assesses that Russia's combat power, everything that they have available to them, is somewhere between 85 and 90%. So and whoever this NATO official is saying this, these numbers don't, don't add up. Where are they getting this number from? And just to let you know what what the Pentagon means when they say combat power, they actually were asked, what does that mean? And so they explained that in this Defense Department briefing uh, from yesterday. So it says on the combat power, when we talk about assessed combat power, we're talking about their inventories, not just the people, and that's certainly part of it, but also tanks and armored vehicles, artillery systems, fighter and fighter bomber aircraft, helicopters, and SAMs, which is surface to air missiles. Uh, ballistic missiles, so it's everything, including naval power in the Black Sea. And we've come up with somewhere between 85 and just less than 90% available to them right now. And again, they, they have said that there have been no attempts to even replenish this. They still feel confident that they have enough to do whatever it is that they're trying to do. The West is trying to convince the, the world that Russia is being crushed, but they, they can't be being crushed and losing 40,000 troops every month and still have 90% of their combat power available to them and not even having to touch what other power they have to draw from across all of the rest of Russia. Now, people will say, well, then, Brian, how come... How come Russia is taking so long? Why, why is this taking so long? And I just want to remind people that this is not an episode of G.I. Joe. They are going into a very large country. They're fighting against a very well-prepared and well-trained and, and well-equipped military with almost infinite backing from, from the West. 
and they are trying to take over population centers with over a million people or more in each. So, so this is not something that's easy to do. Uh, and we have uh, an example of Russia itself carrying out military operations like this. They did this in Syria from 2015 onward up to and including right now, Russia has been in Syria helping the Syrian government take back heavily populated centers, secure them, and uh, protect them from, from ever falling into the hands of Western-sponsored terrorists ever again. So uh, let's take a look at this. This is Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. And if you read through this, you, you will see that they are not pro-Russian at all. They have a very low opinion of Russia. They don't hesitate to repeat baseless claims or to cite dubious organizations like Human Rights Watch. One thing they will say is that uh, Russia has performed very well in Syria. Just four years after directly entering the Syrian war, Russia has done the unthinkable. It has helped Syrian President Bashar al-Assad retake much of the country from rebel control. And when they say rebels, they mean Al-Qaeda and ISIS, who the U.S. was sponsoring and arming. Moscow's air campaign in Syria was the largest outside of Russian territory since the end of the Cold War. To be sure, there are still areas of resistance like Idlib and Turkish and Kurdish forces control terrain in northern and eastern Syria, but the battlefield victories in Syria have been undeniable. With Russian assistance, Syrian and Iranian-supported ground forces retook Der Ezzor in the east and Aleppo, Homs, Damascus, and other cities across the country. None of this looked possible in, in late 2015, when Russian policymakers assessed that the Syrian regime might collapse without rapid and decisive assistance. Instead of deploying large numbers of Russian army forces to engage in ground combat in Syria, as the Soviet Union did in Afghanistan in the 1980s, Moscow relied on Syrian army forces, Lebanese Hezbollah, other militias, and private military companies as the main ground maneuver elements. The Russian Air Force and Navy supported these forces by conducting strikes from fixed wing aircraft and ships in the Mediterranean and Caspian Seas. And now they're talking about Aleppo, and they're talking about uh, from September through December 2016, they focused on encircling rebel positions in eastern parts of the city. In addition to air and naval strikes, the Russians supported ground forces with Orlan unmanned aerial vehicles, electronic warfare capabilities, forward air controllers, and soldiers from the 120th Russian Guard Artillery Regiment. By December 2016, ground forces had effectively encircled and crushed rebel groups operating in the city. The International Committee of the Red Cross helped oversee the evacuation of civilians and fighters by bus and car out of eastern Aleppo to areas in western Aleppo and in neighboring Idlib. And so wh what did Russia do? Russia was providing the air power and very specific uh, capabilities on the ground while Syrian forces and their Iranian and Lebanese allies formed the, gr the main bulk of the ground forces going into these cities. So they would encircle them, they would create corridors for civilians to leave, they would negotiate with the armed groups inside the city. Some of them would lay down arms and evacuate by bus, just as this uh, combating terrorism center at West Point paper admits. And then they would continue to close in until they retook the city. And then they, uh, between the Syrians, uh, because it's their country and the Russian military police, they would, may, they would establish law and order in the city once again and return life back to normal. That is what they are doing in Ukraine right now. That is exactly what they're doing. And it, it could take months to encircle and then close in on a city. It could take months to do that. It's a, it's a very systematic, methodical process. If they wanted to just level the city and bury everyone alive in it, they could, they could do that very quickly, just like the U.S. did in, say, Fallujah in Iraq. Uh, so, but that's not what they wanted to do. That's not what they wanted to do in Syria, because once the city was taken, they had to rebuild it and administer it. And once they take these cities in Ukraine, they want to rebuild them and administer them. What I'm going to show you next is an animation. It's an animation of the retaking of Aleppo, and then I'm going to show you an animation of the taking of Mariupol in Ukraine. 
and you are going to see how it is the same process. Areas in red are controlled by the Syrian government. Areas in green are controlled by the US sponsored terrorists. And that territory that the terrorists held in Aleppo, that connected all the way to the Turkish border where they were receiving all of their arms and reinforcements and everything else that they needed to continue fighting. And so part of taking over the city, retaking it, liberating it, was encircling it and cutting the fighters holding the city off from that supply line. Russia would bomb the supply line, but then they would also physically block it off with military forces on the ground. And this is exactly what they did in Mariupol. And as you can see, uh, the, the battle went back and forth. There were forces outside, armed militants outside the encirclement trying to break in to help the fighters trapped inside get out and there were multiple attempts from the fighters inside to consolidate all of their firepower and try to break through this is a very common theme in warfare all throughout history and so that was what was going on in aleppo until eventually syria retook the city and to this day it stands uh, safe secure stable and it's in the process of being rebuilt after years of being occupied by terrorists sponsored by the west and so now here is mariupol same exact process, Russian troops approaching from two axes, from uh, the Donbas region in the east and from uh, Crimea in the southwest. They, they linked up, they encircled Mariupol, and then they moved in on the city center. And all during that process, we remember in the news them trying to establish humanitarian corridors to get civilians out, uh, uh, giving the, because Mariupol was being primarily defended by Azov Nazis, and the Russian military gave them multiple chances to lay down their arms and come out. There were multiple ultimatums, and then when they passed, they moved in and they decimated these units that refused to surrender. Same, same as in Syria, and it takes time. It takes time to do this, unless you just want to bury everyone in the city alive all at one time. Mariupol's a relatively small city. Uh, other cities like Kherson, fell already and russia controls cities like kherson uh, kharkov kiev it'll be the same situation it'll be a long-term process of establishing the encirclement closing the forces off inside evacuating civilians giving fighters inside the opportunity to surrender uh, possibly instead of uh, ending up in the custody of the russians moving westward maybe just like they they did in syria sending them to idlib and, and so it's going to be a very long, drawn-out process. You can't take these cities by force overnight. It's not an episode of G.I. Joe. This takes time. It took months and months to take certain cities in, in Syria. And it will take months and months to take certain cities in Ukraine. Uh, Russia is now pacing itself. They, they call it, it's a war of attrition. No, they are pacing themselves. They're doing exactly in Ukraine what they did in Syria. But instead of having Syrian forces on the ground, now it is Russian forces. And let's look at the situation in Ukraine. An overview. You have all of this territory held by Russia. There has been no, I mean, there has been talk of Ukrainian counterattacks, they, they might temporarily push into a certain pocket, uh, but they have not retaken any significant amount of territory from Russia, and they're not going to. They won't. Mariupol is all but secured as of recording. I mean, you, you have terrorists hiding out in, inside the city, so it'll take time to mop up. Uh, but the fighting capacity of Azov in Mariupol has collapsed. There's no longer a significant fighting force there. Uh, just like in Aleppo and, and other places in Syria, after the main battle is over, you're going to have holdouts and snipers, and you, you got to go through there and disarm unexploded ordnance and booby traps. And so it, it'll be a process. Again, this is reality. This is not something, this isn't like in a movie. Now I want to point out some other things here. You, you see what's going on here. This is the line of contact. There are Ukrainian forces, a significant number of, of uh, heavily armed, dug in Ukrainian forces along this line of contact here. And they are being encircled. There's a salient coming down from the north. When they're done in Mariupol, this will go up from the south. And all of the Ukrainian forces 
in this pocket will be encircled. It'll no longer be possible to send reinforcements or fuel or food or water or ammunition or weapons to those fighters caught inside that pocket. And then they have two choices to surrender or to be decimated. And this is a massive, massive encirclement. When you talk about a city being encircled, that is one thing. This is a, an entire region of Ukraine being encircled. Now, what else has been going on this week, uh, this fifth week? We keep hearing the Western media accuse Russia of preparing to use chemical or, or nuclear weapons. And I, I just want to show you this from the Harvard Gazette. And I've mentioned this before, and I have a whole video about why Russia would never use chemical weapons, how, how chemical weapons are even less effective than regular conventional weapons. And uh, I'll explain it again real quick here, just because this is the weekly update. Uh, so this is the Harvard Gazette. Uh, Russia's remaining weapons are horrific and confounding. And as you'll find out that that's actually nonsense. And this was March 23rd, 2022. And they're talking to this guy, Matthew Bunn. Bunn spoke with the Gazette about Russia's potential use of chemical and biological weapons in Ukraine and how the Biden administration and the West may respond. And so uh, they ask him about it and he says, from a purely military perspective, there are no military targets that nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons could destroy that Russia can't destroy with its air power and rockets. The main purpose of using them would probably be to try to shock the Ukrainians into surrender. But you know what? If you wanted to shock the Ukrainians into surrender, you could just use your conventional weapons and flatten the city and bury them alive in their own city. And that, that would shock them and it would be uh, at done at a much lower political price than using chemical weapons. So again, uh, conventional weapons can do everything that chemical weapons can do, uh, but just many times more effective, including shocking people into surrendering. Uh, let's see what else he says. Unfortunately, a lot of Russia's capabilities are secret. Well, then if they're secret, how do you know about these capabilities that they even exist? So now we're now we're getting into uh, what the West always does when it comes to WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, is they're just making stuff up. They're speculating. They're making baseless accusations. So what does he say? He says, uh, under the Biological Weapons Convention, they're not supposed to have any biological weapons, but they are thought to be violating that convention and still maintaining some offensive biological weapons capabilities. Similarly, under the Chemical Weapons Convention, they're not supposed to have any chemical weapons anymore, but are believed to have significant stocks. They have used small amounts of chemical weapons in assassination or assassination attempts against dissidents, both in Russia against Alexei Navalny and in the UK against Sergei and Yulia Skripal. That's hilarious because uh, all, all three of them are still alive and well. And so, first of all, there's no evidence that Russia did that. It would make no sense for Russia to do that. And just think about it. This is the perfect example of how useless chemical weapons are. Uh, they're claiming that Russia tried to kill three people with chemical weapons and three times they failed. Now, I guarantee you, if they just sent a, a secret agent with a pistol and they shot at each one of these people, at least one of them would be dead. And so this is just how ridiculous the West is when they're making up things about their, their adversaries. It's so divorced from reality, but then they know how poorly informed Western audiences are and that they'll believe virtually anything. And so we're in dangerous waters. When, when the US says that Russia is desperate, their back is up against the wall, and they're willing to use chemical weapons to fight their way out. When I just walked you through why Russia is taking their time in Ukraine and how they're doing exactly what they did successfully, very successfully in Syria, uh, confirmed by even Western military analysts. When you hear the US talking like that, it's because the US, their back is against the wall. And they're the ones that are going to use chemical weapons so that they can broaden the, the options available to them to more deeply intervene in Ukraine and possibly confound uh, Russia's military operations in some way, just like they tried to do in Syria on multiple occasions. One more thing I want to say uh, before I finish is you will, you will hear analysts making presumptions about what's going on in Ukraine. They're looking at very uh, you know small case studies 
uh, a single video put out by Ukraine's war propaganda effort. And then they'll extrapolate the entire course of the conflict by looking at that and assuming that any, even if it is an actual shortcoming on Russia's part, they will extrapolate a, a week into the future, a month into the future, and they will extrapolate as if Russia will see that shortcoming and do absolutely nothing to solve it. And we have watched them adjust after the first, second, third, and fourth week. We, they have been adjusting their strategy. They have been looking at what's going on, what works and what isn't working, and they have been shifting things around on the ground. So whatever you see them doing now, this week, in terms of a shortcoming that you've identified or, or can see developing, by next week, they're going to be doing something to try to fix that. And whether they're successful or not is another story, but they will begin fixing it. And so these predictions based on Russia not changing anything over the next week or the next month, th this is ridiculous. This is poor analysis. This is uh, people claiming to be experts who cannot think in four dimensions. They can only think in the here and now, and they extrapolate the here and now over a week or a month. They cannot look at it and see how it will evolve over time. So going forward into the next week, until the next update, uh, we should be on the lookout for the US and NATO trying to open up an opportunity for themselves to get more directly involved in Ukraine. Maybe not necessarily to fight Russia directly, but to grab some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine and then try to expand that as close as possible to where Russia is operating right now to kind of uh, close the gap so to speak, that logistics need to cross to get to the front lines in Ukraine, and also just to prevent the complete loss of Ukraine. At the end of this disastrous game that the US and NATO have played with the country over the last eight years. Uh, so until then, uh, this is a new format, this weekly update on the Russian-Ukrainian conflict specifically. I had been doing these with Angelo live, but we want to kind of dive into other topics every week for that. We'll still do an update, a shorter update, but I want to consolidate everything once a week uh, regarding the situation in, in Ukraine and put it into one video so you could get everything all at one time. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share it. Think about subscribing. It's free to do and it helps the channel grow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check the video description below for other places you can find my work in case YouTube deletes my channel. I have already been deleted off of Twitter for talking about Ukraine. And so it's probably just a matter of time before I'm gone from YouTube. I'm on Odyssey. I'm also on Rumble. All of my videos on YouTube get automatically uploaded to both. So please check those out. I'm working on my website. A lot of people are pointing out that my website is down, newatlas.report. Yes, it is down. I am working on that. In the meantime, you can go to my old blog, landdestroyer.blogspot.com. That will be in the video description below. You can check out that. I am updating that on a daily basis until my main website is back up. Check the video description below for all of the links that I referenced in this video. And there is a lot of other extra reading material that I have included so that you can, can look at the sources that I'm looking at to put this composite picture together. I'm looking at things from Russia's side, the US's side, uh, Ukraine side. I'll put that in the video description below. There are also ways you can help support my work. To everyone who has been helping me, whether it's through one-time donations or month-to-month -month through Buy Me A Coffee or just month-to-month -month through Patreon or one-time donations through uh, PayPal and there's a couple of other options down there. Thank you so much. And thank you also to everyone who has been sharing my work or sending news tips or kind words. All of this is greatly appreciated. I could not do this work without all of that type of support. So thank you so much. And as always, thank you for watching.